Uh, I am joined by my partner in book talk criming, uh, Connie Cartledge, Senior Archive Specialist in the Manuscript Division of the Library of Congress. Uh, she is a co-author with myself of Richard Nixon's Political Scandal, Researching Watergate in the Manuscript Division Collections at the Library of Congress, and the Federal Paper Chase, Judges, Papers, in the Manuscript Division, uh, which I will say that uh, Professor Kastenberg has drawn upon, uh, not necessarily the LibGuide itself, but the collections described in the LibGuide uh, for the book that he is discussing today. During her illustrious career, uh, Connie has processed many legal journalism and political collections, including the papers of Harry A. Blackman, arguably the greatest SCOTUS collection ever, uh, Gerhard Alden Gessel, arguably the greatest district court judge collection ever, ever, Frank M. Johnson, Harold Leventhal, Anthony Lewis, need I even say it, uh, Thurgood Marshall, uh, Mary McGrory, Daniel P. Moynihan, Sandra Day O'Connor, John J. Sirica, John Paul Stevens, and J. Skelly Wright. Uh, I am Ryan Reft. As noted, I focus on 20th century policy and domestic politics, which includes law, uh, which is why I'm here. Uh, Professor Joshua Kastenberg, a regular in our reading room, uh, who has written many, many books uh, of legal history, has a 20-year career as a lawyer judge in the Air Force. He served as an advisor to the Department of Defense on cybersecurity and cyber warfare matters, twice deployed to Iraq, and oversaw the military's compliance with international law. Professor Kastenberg served as prosecutor and defense counsel in more than 200 trials and as a judge in more than 200 other trials. He has been cited by the Washington Post and appeared on the BBC, the CBC, NBC, SCTV, and Fox News. Kastenberg's media experience adds to his effectiveness in drawing an audience and in presenting remarks in an engaging manner. And we are about to engage everyone. Uh, as Professor Kastenberg is going to give us an overview of the book to be followed by a little Q&A uh, with Connie and I, and then hopefully questions from the audience. So take it away, Professor Kastenberg. Thank you so much. And, and first off, I want to say um, thank you to the members of the Manuscript Division of the Library of Congress. Um, you perform a what I think is the platinum standard of public service of preserving the history of our nation um, in its deepest forms, including the motivations and uh, and and other matters uh, that are so important to preserving democracy. I also want to thank the University Press of Kansas and in particular David Congdon, who served as my editor uh, uh, for two books and has displayed a remarkable degree of professionalism and patience with me. Uh, and with that, I, I'd like to begin with um, taking us back to 1978, 1979, and the complexities of the world we, we lived through at that time, uh, which rival today's complexities, uh, even in an era of social media. But before I do, I, I think it's important at the outset to say what this book and the case of Goldwater versus Carter that goes to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court does not issue an opinion, but rather issues an order, and I'll get into that, is all about. And it's about constitutional silence and what other the other two branches of government, the executive branch and the legislative branch, may or may not be able to do in an arena of constitutional si silence. The United States Constitution clearly states how the United States gets into a treaty. There are two players and two players only. One is the president and the other is the United States Senate. It doesn't even include the House of Representatives. The framers of the Constitution believed this was sufficient for the United States to go into a binding treaty. It requires two thirds of the senators uh, present. And once the country is in a treaty, treaties become the law of the land with the exception of this doctrine that formed significantly after the Constitution about whether treaties were self-implementing or, or not. But the United States Constitution says nothing about removal from a treaty. And it appears that the framers of the Constitution believe that the United States would be governed by gentlemen of, of you know, ethical strains and a, a treaty would be like a handshake. It would be the George Washington view that would be something that we would keep. And in the early history of the United States, when the United States was removed from a treaty, it's because the country the United States signed into a treaty with no longer existed or governments changed. And the classic example is the United States had a treaty with the Netherlands. And then along comes Napoleon and Napoleon installs his younger brother as sort of the monarch of the or the emperor of the Netherlands and the government of the Netherlands collapses. And the United States is thereby removed from that treaty because the government of the Netherlands had collapsed. It no longer existed. And, and that's 
what this case begins with. In 1978, in December of 1978, after the Chinese Premier Deng Xiaoping came to the United States, President Carter announced the United States would remove itself from the mutual defense treaty with the Republic of China, a country today we refer to as Taiwan. That treaty came about in 1954. Uh, and we would recognize the People's Republic of China as the one China. Now, that wasn't unique in the sense that the British, the French, the West Germans, uh, the Canadians had already done that. And also, it was part of a process that President Richard Nixon began when he visited China in 1972. But there were old stalwarts in the United States Congress who argued that the president first had to have approval of either the Senate or the Congress as a whole to remove the United States from such an important treaty. They were led by Sir Senator Barry Goldwater, a Republican from Arizona, who presciently argued, although he was laughed at for this argument, if a president can remove the United States from a treaty with the Republic of China today without the consent of Congress, then nothing will stop a future president from removing the United States from NATO. And that was the basis of his argument going in. Goldwater was not a lawyer, he was not a constitutional scholar, um, but he was a hardcore conservative who believed uh, that the People's Republic of China could not be negotiated with and that it presented a danger equal to or one day would be equal to the Soviet Union. So he dug his heels and informed a unique alliance to challenge Carter on Carter's unilateral action. If I could get the next slide. Well, let's take a look at the world of the 1970s. When we talk about chaos, and I mentioned this to my students who are in their mid 20s, they have a tendency to look back and think things were existed in a simpler of uh, time, but they didn't. If we were, if, for those of us who were alive and uh, remember this in the 1970s, the early 70s, the entire Penn Central Railroad, which was really almost all of the railroads of the Northeast that had been combined into one, went bankrupt. And that caused an economic um, ripple effect through the entire nation. It occurred at the same time as the oil crisis of 1973 and the steel meltdown of 1973 to 1975, when cities like Youngstown, Ohio, had gone from almost full employment to full unemployment. At the same time, Americans were doubling and tripling their gas payments, not only at the pumps, both in 1973 and again in 1979 because of wars in the Middle East and the emergence of OPEC um, as a political global political power, uh, but home heating oil became too expensive for Americans to suffer through in the Midwest, you know, to pay through in the Midwest and in the North or in the United States government among Americans coming out of the Vietnam War and a number of congressional important one I would say the church committee investigation into the CIA and the FBI and beginning in 1974 uh, and significant reforms which were important for the country but which may have weakened American intelligence capabilities um, in the years after and finally and this is one thing I drive home to the students uh, there were significant economic disagreements with the United States as NATO partners in Western Europe over trade and finance, and we were practically on the point of a fiscal war with Britain, France, and West Germany over the valuation of the Deutsche Mark, the Franc, the pound, tariffs on steel importation, the very thing the United States was struggling with, they were too, and it looked like NATO was getting frayed over economic disagreements as well. And if I can get the next slide, this will continue. The 1970s were hardly a time of peace. Just because the United States exits Vietnam in 1979 doesn't mean that wars end in the world. In fact, they get bloodier and bloodier. Um, and governments are, are in the democratic countries are, are frayed as well. We tend to look at the government of Japan as being a bulwark of democracy. And for the most part, they are a model of, of democracy and efficiency. But in 1976, the Japanese leadership took payoffs from Lockheed, as well as the West German defense minister. This resulted in indictments being handed down in Japan 
uh, against their their president and and others. Uh, the Japanese democracy was sort of teetering for a brief time on this. India and Pakistan go to war, and deaths occur by the tens of thousands. In Nigeria, there's a breakaway republic in Biafra, and there's a practical genocide that's occurring there. And Richard Nixon and the United States government, uh, understanding the population is sick of war, does very little except appoints a professor of law to be the ambassador to Biafra, and it falls to organizations like the Beatles rock band to bring a public awareness um, on human disaster that's going on there. Similarly, the Ethiopian Civil War, the Israeli-Arab War of 1973, known as the Yom Kippur War, and the Angolan Civil War, in which the Congress steps in and tells President Gerald Ford, you will not spend a cent in Angola unless we approve that cent being spent in Angola. There was, a, there was a belief that Angola could become a new Vietnam as the Soviet Union and China uh, became more involved in that civil war. So if I can get the next slide too, please. For the United States by 1978, the war in Vietnam still rippled through uh, the United States political system. There was a, 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 a terrific loss or an unfortunate loss of trust, very understandable in our government, um, our government's ability to react to foreign affairs, to domestic crises. Uh, the US-USSR dynamic of a bipolar world kind of remained in the forefront of our political leaders at that time. But there were new fissures that added to the world chaos. Portugal almost fell to communism in 1974. 1973 to 75, our, al our NATO ally in Greece uh, was under a military dictatorship. And then crazily enough, in 1974, two NATO allies, without the influence of the Soviet Union, practically go to war over Cyprus in a very complex matter. And Congress is split, not by party alignment, but by whose district may have had a number of Greek Americans in it and whose district didn't um, over how, what the NATO response should be. And this, there were two congressional vetoes over President Ford's efforts to um, do something militarily and fiscally in regard to stopping this war from breaking out and, and causing a fish, you know, a breakup of at least two NATO countries. If I could get the next slide, please. There's another aspect of Carter's actions towards recognizing the People's Republic of China that make it important to note this was not uniquely Jimmy Carter, particularly in light of the fact that President Jimmy Carter's commitment to human rights was more pronounced, I would argue, than any other president uh, in United States history, at least since the end of World War II, if not for all time. But the China-Soviet rift presented Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter with a unique way of bringing stability to US foreign policy. Nixon would call, and Kissinger called it triangulation. Carter called it stability. In 19, 1969, China and uh, Russia, their militaries exchanged gunfire over their border. In the midst of the Vietnam War, where both countries were supporting North Vietnam, although the Soviet support was far more pronounced. In 1971, Henry Kissinger travels to the People's Republic of China rather quietly. It sets up a meeting the next year for Richard Nixon to do the same thing. Nixon, an old anti-communist stalwart, it's often been said only Nixon could do it, and he did it. In 1972, in February, the Shanghai Communique was signed, and basically that's the road to the United States recognizing the People's Republic of China and trying to engage in more uh, connected economics, more connected understandings uh, with the People's Republic of China to bring stability to a chaotic world. If I could get the next slide, please. Just really quickly taking a look at Carter, and I'm not a psychoanalyst, and I'm not particularly a aficionado of psychological histories, uh, but Carter was unique as presidents go. He wasn't a lawyer. He wasn't immersed in the law. He was a Naval Academy graduate and a nuclear engineer who went back to being a peanut farmer, but he did go against the grain of Southern politics um, as a governor of Georgia. He 
he made it very clear that he believed that the era of segregation had to end and the era of civil rights and, and racial equality had to occur for the South and it had to occur from within the South. So when he became the first Southerner since Woodrow Wilson to be a Democratic presidential nominee or a presidential nominee, um, he was a unique candidate. He didn't come from the Democratic Party machine. Um, he was an outsider. And it enabled him to adopt, I think, human rights as a foreign policy mantra. Uh, so he becomes the Democratic Party nominee in 1976, and then he defeats Gerald Ford, but not by a mandate. But he does defeat him as what I would argue is, was the most unique presidential candidate in 20th century um, history. If I could please get the next slide. Carter was hampered by foreign policy. Sometimes he had great victories, sometimes he had opposition, and he had to navigate the chaotic world. He was hampered by the War Powers Resolution. Um, more than any other president, he agreed that it ought to be important to be hemmed in by it. Um, he wanted to, uh, to return the Panama Canal to Panama. He certainly had opposition both with conservative Democrats and conservative um, are very conservative Republicans who challenged him in the courts, but he it didn't go to the Supreme Court, uh, but he won. Um, he was he was confined by the Helsinki Accords with the Soviet Union, but his successes would include uh, the Camp David Accords, peace between Egypt and Israel, navigating the South, uh, the Republic of Korea, the South Korean when the president was assassinated there. Um, Nicaragua, he tried to bring a sense of human rights to Central America. And then we get to Taiwan and the subject we're here for uh, as I go through the slides, if I could get the next one. I would argue, as I do in the book, that Panama and, and the Republic of China are interconnected. Uh, Carter believed that the rest of the world saw the Panama Canal as the last of a line of, of imperialism, of European imperialism. In this case, the United States is imperialism. And uh, he, he continued on a process that Lyndon Johnson began, but he accelerated that and entered into two treaties with bipartisan support in the Senate, but with a lot of legal challenges to return the canal uh, to the Panamanians and end uh, once and for all what he believed was a signature piece of US imperialism and for the US to regain its um, city on a hill, as you were, mantra that Reagan talked about, that was necessary. That made him an enemy out of Barry Goldwater. And then there's the Re Republic of China. I mentioned in 1954, um, Eisenhower convinced the Senate to sign in this treaty, and the United States threatened the, Republic, the People's Republic of China with war. Carter, when he was elected, more or less, made indirect statements that he would continue the relationship that had been involved with the with the Republic of China. But that's going to change in 78. If I could get the next slide, please. So here's the conservative lion, Barry Goldwater. I would say that Barry Goldwater uh, would have been the most likely member of the United States Senate to go to, to try to stop this from happening. Um, partly because Goldwater was in the Senate along with um, one other member uh, who voted on the treaty in 1954, as well as a renewal on it. But it's important to also know that Goldwater and his Senate alliance may have been the old lions, but two very young members in the House of Representatives joined with him and they got sort of their political start in this opposing Carter and got quite a bit of media time and that's Newt Gingrich and Dan Quayle. And this alliance decided to fight Carter, uh, Carter's actions in the US court. You can see a letter that I've gotten from the Library of Congress from Goldwater uh, to a member of Taiwan's um, delegation where uh, Goldwater expressed disgust that Nixon, Ford, and now Carter have lied to him over the, over the status of, of Taiwan. If I could get the next slide, please. The first an important legal issue in this is how do you get a, a, a case to court and that's standing. And Goldwater is going to win on this in the court of Oliver Gash in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia. But he's going to win the second round, not the first. 
And the, the issue on standing is, is there a discrete and concrete injury that he has suffered? And the reason I say that is he doesn't represent Congress in this matter. He represents one, well, he represents six United States senator. Does he have a direct interest in the outcome? And is there a prohibition from the courts taking up the matter by law? And, and this is an important issue for constitutional law that we teach our first year law students on. Carter, Goldwater doesn't have a very good argument when this first comes up, but the Senate gives him a favor, does him a favor or does him a solid. They pass a resolution that they believe um, that, that Carter had to go to the Senate first before rescinding the treaty. And that resolution gets Goldwater standing to raise his claim in the U.S. District Court. And if I could have the next slide. There's one case um, that will help him out, but the weight of the law is against him at this point. Nonetheless, Judge Oliver Gash, who was appointed by Lyndon Johnson, determines in September of 1979 that Goldwater possesses standing and Carter would have to go to the Senate to seek approval for the removal of the United States from the Mutual Defense Treaty with Taiwan. And that sends a, a second bombshell through the legal world and the political world for first time in history, a US district court judge informs a president, you have to go to the United States Congress first, or in this case, the Senate first. If I could get the next uh, slide, please. In between Gash's two decisions, I argue there's political events that drive that decision along. Not that Gash was a politician, but that showed the chaos of the world. One is um, we wanted to have the country weaned off of oil. Nuclear energy made a, was a huge promise. You have the Three Mile Island meltdown. The other is the Shah of Iran is toppled, flees to the United States. Um, there's the first attack on the US embassy in Tehran. Anti-Soviet militants in Afghanistan, for whatever reason, and it's still shrouded in mystery, attacked the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, and either they or the Soviets, in attempting to stop this, murder or kill our United States ambassador there, and the Chinese army invades Vietnam. At the very time, too, there's a mass resignation of cabinet secretaries from Carter's administration. This is chaotic. And Gash acknowledges this in his second uh, order, telling Carter, you've got to go to the Congress. If I could get the next slide. Well, then it goes to the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, and we get up to this concept called justiciability. And the way justiciability worked in 1979 is that in order for, uh, in order for a person or an entity to bring a court, it has to be justiciable, meaning it has to have a subject matter that the courts can rule on. And the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia made a decision in a per curiam uh, decision, meaning not all of them were aligned, that only because of the unique wording of the treaty, there's an exit clause, could Carter do what he did? And then decided, well, that unique wording on Article 10 of the treaty, the exit clause enabling a president to remove, which had never said that in direct language, but you could infer it, um, would, would they reverse Gash's decision? Uh, they did hint that that couldn't be the case with NATO because NATO doesn't have an exit clause in it. So they found a case or con they, they, they said there's no case or controversy in this particular matter, but there would be in regard to other treaties that didn't have an exit clause in there. If I could get the next slide. But then it goes to the Supreme Court and it runs right into the political question doctrine. And what I tell my students is the political question doctrine boils down to this. It's the courts deciding there's a significant constitutional issue at play they made it very complex in Baker versus Carr in 62, significant constitutional issue at play, but we're not gonna rule on it. And the reason we're not gonna rule on it, it's too complex, it's too political, let the other two branches of government rule on it. And that's what happens in Goldwater versus Carter. The Supreme Court dismisses the suit and basically tells um, the, brand, the, the elective branches of government, this is your problem, work it out and do what you're going to do with it. You have other avenues. Just as an aside, so I have enough time for questions, there's an important case in 1974 called Schlesinger versus Reservist Committee to Stop the War, a group of anti-Vietnam War 
uh, citizens uh, who were in certain congressional districts sued saying that members of Congress could not hold military commissions because that made them amenable to the commander in chief authority of the president and therefore they're not independent members of Congress. The lower court said you're right that weakens Congress and there's a specific clause in the Constitution prohibiting that. But the Supreme Court in reversing on the political question doctrine said, be that as it may, this is a problem for the Congress of the United States and the president to work out themselves. And we cannot take cognizance or justiciability of the issue. So that's the political question doctrine in a nutshell. Five justices on the Supreme Court decided the political uh, question doctrine, or four justices the political question doctrine prohibited the court from taking up the issue. One, one concurrence, Justice Lewis Powell argued, in another time and another matter, we could do it if enough members of Congress, like a simple majority opposed it, but there's not enough there there. So I'm gonna join with the majority. And then you have three justices, Blackman, White, and Brennan, arguing that the court could take up the issue, that it was of a sufficient con uh, constitutional magnitude, that the court had a duty to take up the issue. And if I could please get the next slide. By the time the court issued this decision, the Soviet Union was on the cusp of formally invading Afghanistan. Hostages were taken in Tehran. The U.S. Embassy had been attacked in Pakistan. Muammar Gaddafi in Libya threatened the United States. The Europeans and the Japanese refused to make a statement on how to address Khomeini and the seizure of hostages in Iran. There were rogue CIA and other intelligence agents suing the United States. And this is why I would argue that it only took the U.S. Supreme Court without oral argument less than 15 days to get the issue and then make a decision to punt the issue back to the Congress and say, you decide. You're the ones who are supposed to do foreign policy and domestic policy and give us stability. It's not our job to do that because if we do that, we'll be entering into the political thicket which our constitution specifically prohibits us from doing. If I could please get the next slide, thank you. Did the court issue a decision? Not really. Um, if we examine the issue today, what I would say is the courts have left the decision to remove the United States from a treaty, including NATO, to the political branches of government, to the House and to the Senate uh, to determine, and the court will stay out of that even if it included NATO. Here's where the justices fell. Uh, Berger uh, argued the Senate and the House had never resisted or opposed Carter as a body. Rehnquist drove home the political question doctrine that four justices followed suit with. Powell, I already explained, Blackman wanted a decision based on constitutional importance. And Brennan wanted to argue that Goldwater was trying to realign the powers of, of the various, the three branches of government to a degree that the constitution wouldn't tolerate. And therefore a decision, a published opinion was important. But as we stand here today, there is no uh, U.S. Supreme Court ruling and no court ruling on how the United States exits a treaty, if I could continue. Um, and this is my final point. Uh, Goldwater argued a president could remove the United States versus NATO, from NATO. He was laughed at. The, the irony to that is twofold. One is that it happened, at least imp there was an implied with the prior administration that it could happen that the US would exit NATO. Whether we would do so or not is an open question. Uh, the other irony is a little bit less than that, is it was Goldwater that pushed Rehnquist to go on the court. He was the personal lobbyist, the two Arizonans, to Richard Nixon to get Rehnquist on the court in the first place. And they were very good friends. But in this case, it was a case of two conservatives looking at the Constitution significantly differently without losing their friendship um, in the process. And with that, I'll conclude my presentation because I think I've gone a little bit over and open it up to questions. Uh, no problem, Josh. Uh, Connie is going to kick us off. Uh, thank you, Josh, for that great uh, overview. Uh, my first question is, why was Senator Goldwater not able to marshal more support from his uh, lawsuit among his fellow senators? Yeah. And how did the issue of standing impact 
the case in uh, all levels of the federal courts? So, so that's a great question, the first one on Goldwater. And I, I've gone through his papers at Arizona State University where the Historic Society transferred them there. And I've gone through Senator Bob Dole's papers and um, also the House uh, Senate Minority Leader uh, Baker in Tennessee. And the best answer I can give through that is Dole had already lost lawsuits against um, Carter involving the return of cultural properties to Hungary, which was a country at that time behind the Iron Curtain. And he didn't, Dole also feared that the court might rule with Carter. And so he wanted out of it. Uh, Baker wanted the just simple House resolutions. Baker was a moderate Republican, and he viewed Goldwater's actions as, as a bit um, extreme. And then there are others um, who one might have thought would have aligned with Goldwater, and they were afraid that a court ruling in favor of Goldwater um, would would hamper the Congress in, in the future. And they had no idea that Carter wouldn't win re-election. Actually, there's some good letter writing that, that, that they believe Carter would likely win re-election and serve a second term. And so they, they feared that possibility. As for standing, the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, and I'll put a plug in for the manuscript division on this, because with the exception of one judge that I looked at, McKinnon, who's dissented in this, and McKinnon's papers are at the Minnesota Historical Society, and I've gone through them. Um, but I think the Court of Appeals papers of McGowan, Leventhal, Wright, Fahey, and the others are some of the most magnificent collections um, that the LOC or that exist in the United States. And they, they grappled with standing. They didn't want to expand standing. They wanted to keep standing narrow, um, uh, but they recognized they had ruled in a case called Kennedy versus Sampson that they had given standing to Senator Ted Kennedy in one very narrow case. They wanted to keep that, that avenue alive. So they did this really close navigation through the issue. And uh, what they arrived at is the plain language of the treaty denied Goldwater standing and that Oliver Gash, whose papers are at Georgetown, but many of them are in Gerhard Gazelle's collections at the Library of Congress as well, uh, because they wrote quite a lot to each other, um, that they believed Gash had given too broad of a ruling, but it wasn't necessarily incorrect. It was incorrect to the actual issue. And, and by the way, on the Supreme Court issue, the Burger Court believed that they needed to narrow standing down from the Warren Court. They were still grappling with William O. Douglas's attempts to expand standing to include not trees, he's been maligned for that comment, but the Sierra Club to represent the environment um, in, in, in stopping government encroachment into environmental um, lands. So I yeah. hope that answers your question. Yeah, just to follow up on Connie's question, um, some conservatives appear to be wary of the case as a sort of double-edged sword. Yes. Uh, how so and why? Well, the double-edged sword is this. Um, the conservatives believe, like Baker, for example, and even I would say Robert Dole, that although they often aligned with Strom Thurmond and, and Goldwater and looked at them as leaders, they looked at Goldwater and Thurmond also as reactionaries. And this was a case to them of be careful what you ask for, you might get it. Because if a president is hampered today, um, then a president is hampered by the same law tomorrow. And with the big bad Soviet Union in the, in the Eastern Bloc there, they worried about if the court would prevent a president from acting unilaterally in other areas. And I would say the big winner in this case was Robert Dole and that block of conservatives because they got what they wanted with the Reagan presidency, where Reagan was probably uh, after, you know, and, and after uh, I, I would make this argument that after Franklin Roosevelt, uh, Reagan was probably the most forceful president uh, in terms of executive action in the foreign policy realm without going to Congress first. And uh, they, so they won, they got what they wanted, but, but that's why I think the conservatives um, were over the map on this particular issue. I, would, I didn't wanna call names, but I would say my own estimation is this was a case of conservative reactionaries versus old line conservatives. 
Well, we don't see that anymore. No, um, we don't. <laughs> uh, so uh, you know, this is a timely presentation, one, because of events in the last week or so, one, yeah. first off, but also because uh, in American life, SCOTUS has really, over the last 30, 40 years, I assumed a much larger role in legis not supposed to be legislation, but you could argue legislation and, yeah. and law. So it seems important in your book to kind of discuss a, a point you raise and the imperial judiciary. What is the imperial judiciary and how does it factor into American history? And that's perhaps so, this case. That's a wonderful question. I mean, it really is a wonderful question. Uh, so Arthur Schlesinger Jr. may have been the one to coin the imperial presidency, but he sure popular, popularized it, even if he didn't coin it. And what he argued was from the time of the Gilded Age with Grover Cleveland and the Pullman strike, um, the U.S. sort of went through a pick, uh, including, I mean, going back even earlier with Abraham Lincoln in the Civil War, peaks and valleys of a presidency that had grew beyond what the Constitution intended into an, a dangerous moment. And beginning with the New Deal, which he supported, um, it became more and more dangerous. Uh, you know, Harry Truman not going to Congress for a declaration of war in Korea, uh, Lyndon Johnson and the Vietnam War getting the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, but using that re resolution to go to war um, in, into Vietnam. Uh, Richard Nixon was the greatest sig sign of, of a system run amok to Schlesinger. And Beginning with the end of the Vietnam War, uh, there was an attempt for Congress to reassert itself and the people to hold the presidency in check. And you see this with committee hearings into the CIA, the FBI, the War Powers Act of 73, and the courts largely stay out of that. But this decision to, to order a dismissal, it's not an opinion, uh, but the decision to order a dismissal in Goldwater versus Carter, I argue, rebuilt help rebuild with along with a couple of other decisions afterwards help rebuild the imperial presidency the decisions i argue that are related to it include dames and more versus reagan in which the president can stop a civil suit from happening in the courts under certain conditions if uh, it will affect foreign policy and and that decision arises from the shah of iran and and khomeini's takeover and corporations suing to get payment from the Iranian government for building construction projects they're not getting paid. Um, the other one is, is uh, Nixon versus Fitzgerald, which you cannot sue a president uh, for misconduct in tort law uh, that occurs during the presidency for official presidential acts, which can mean anything. And these are the same justices. And I think within a three-year period, beginning with Goldwater and ending with Fitzgerald, the Supreme Court, whether by intention or by a mistake, rebuilt the imperial presidency that Congress worked really hard to bring into check, and we've never recovered from that. And part of that's the, mainly it's the fault of Congress, but I would say the court enabled it. Thank you there for that answer. Uh, I have a question. You've already mentioned the two uh, central courts, other than the Supreme Court, who played a major role in this case, the United States District Court and the United States Court of Appeals, both located in the District of Columbia. Could you explain the difference between the two and how, how does a case come before uh, the District Court and how does it make its trajectory uh, to the Court of Appeals? And also, I'll throw in there, which is one of our favorite quotes we hear, uh, why is the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia's uh, circuit often described as the second most important court in the land to yeah. the Supreme Court? Those are great questions. So uh, a case goes to the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia, often much in the same manner that it would to any U.S. District Court. There's a case or controversy that arises under federal law, and, 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 or there's a constitutional implication to it that arises out of um, a state judicial hearing, then that's a Byzantine difficult navigation that would take too long. Uh, but it's the starting point of most suits, unless it's a state suing another state, which may happen now in New Mexico versus Texas on a different issue. That would go straight to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, parties can already, always appeal rulings from U.S. district courts. And if the Court of Appeals, and this includes the Court of Appeals from the District of Columbia by a simple majority vote, um, or by a three-judge panel believes that 
uh, an appeal is meritorious from that ruling, they'll take it up and decide whether to publish an opinion or an unpublished opinion. In this particular case, it was so um, deemed so important that they held the hearing what's known as en banc. So instead of a three judge panel, all of the judges other than two who felt like they needed to recuse themselves met and decided the Goldwater versus Carter appeal. Uh, and that was very rapid from September to November when they did that. Um, why is this court the second most important court? Here's why. Um, the other courts, the other, uh, the numbered courts of appeals will hear cases against the US government, but the majority of their cases they hear are actually civil disputes that may be entitled Firestone Tires versus Ford Motor Company. Um, or criminal cases, you know, Jones versus United States. They'll be environmental and, uh, you know, they'll be environmental and government um, excess kind of arguments there. But the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia receives a much higher, considerably higher proportion of cases that are not statutory alone, but are both statutory and constitutional and involve the United States government as a defendant. And so the decisions they issue often have a greater constitutional impact than the decisions which the numbered courts of appeal do. And it's been that way um, since the realignment of the courts, clearly to me, it's since 1911. But it's been that way since the beginning of time, I think, with our country that the courts in Washington, D.C. are going to have the, the majority of cases that issue the greatest number of constitutionally based uh, decisions that will change the way we interpret the Constitution. And then finally, to the Supreme Court, to get a, a writ of certiorari, you have to have four of the justices agreeing that the issue is important enough to bring up for the court to actually hear, which did happen in this case. But then the court did the one what, what one professor has called the first down one yard punt <laughs> I don't use that on a significant constitutional issue and said, this is of such a political nature that we're going to use the political question doctrine that I sort of described quickly already and throw it back to the Congress to decide. Okay, thank you for that. I just want to follow up with, uh, you mentioned some of the collections that you use from our uh, lower federal court uh, judges. Uh, you mentioned Carl McGowan, Harold Leventhal, and J. Skelly Wright. Uh, what did you find that surprised you in those collections? And how do these lower court uh, judges' collections differ from the Supreme Court? Yeah, that, that's, that's a wonderful question. And I want to throw in there that I also use Charles Fahey's collections, although he was out by the time. But some of the earlier cases that were important, he had played a role in. And I, I've used other collections as well, like um, uh, Stevens and um, and Prettyman's collections too, because I go back in time and I think the personal correspondences of the judges are really important. Well, there are two things that I think our listeners ought to know uh, for legal historians too. One is uh, those collections are really robust in their historic background. Uh, they give a wonderful picture of life in the United States generally in a way the Supreme Court decisions don't because they uh, have cases like Church of Scientology versus IRS and, um, you know, uh, Delta Airlines flight attendants versus Delta Airlines. Those cases never make it to the Supreme Court. But if you want to know about gender disparities or religious rights or the limits on the IRS or or air pollution or a police overreach or underreach. Those are the those are the collections you really need to go to, or just American life, like whether or not Coca-Cola, you know, and soft drinks shouldn't be served at school lunches. Th those are cases like that in the 70s that never make it to the Supreme Court, but we still grapple with those today. Um, the other the other thing that I found surprising is how absolutely thoughtful and how absolutely bright. The judges are on those lower courts. They're not second rankers. None of them are. Even though some of them have been portrayed that way, they're first rank, first rate legal minds, and they're often equal to, or I would argue, more thoughtful than their and less political than some of their Supreme Court brethren. And on top of that, the relationship they have with each other, 
doesn't mean that they're going to be on the same side. And that's Leventhal, Wright, and McGowan, all of whom were deemed as being traditional New Deal kind of liberals. They broke apart on the Goldwater issue. And they broke apart on many other issues as well. But they still maintain their collegiality with each other. And so I would encourage legal historians and I would encourage um, those who are crafting appellate briefs and citing to those earlier cases, if they can, to go to those collections. Because as I say to my students, context is everything. And if you don't have context, you're lacking everything in that point. And, and it gives a really good site picture to make those arguments um, from. Thank you for that, Josh. I would just reiterate uh, Professor Kassenberg's points. Uh, you know, it's also, Many cases, not many, but there are several ex examples where cases just end in the, just the uh, Court of Appeals and that ends up being law. Uh, NEPA, the uh, Environmental Act, is one example where a decision by Jay Skelly Wright ended up determining making that law more effective. So that there's other ways to use those collections as well. And we're very thankful that uh, Professor Kastenberg has found a way to utilize them uh, so efficiently. One of the striking differences of this era, at least when, we, when uh, Connie and I read the book and we discussed it with each other, was the tendency of members of Congress from both parties to kind of zealously guard congressional power from the other branches, now, particularly as you noted in the, you know, as they clawed back power from the executive branch. How much did this dynamic shape the case and how would you compare the relationship between Congress and the other two branches then and today? Well, that, so, you know, I, I would say this, after Goldwater versus Carter was issued, Barry Goldwater gave a really laudatory um, statement to, you know, to, to, to the press about all he wanted was the court to make a ruling on it, and he trusted the majority of the court to get it right. That doesn't happen to that degree anymore. There's quite a lot of criticism of the court, and without getting into whether it's merited or not, we know a lot more about the justices' personal lives today uh, through social media and news organizations like Politico than, than was commonly known back then. And I, I touched that on the book I write on William O. Douglas that came out earlier. Um, we know quite a bit more about, uh, about it. Um, the other thing is this about Congress. Congress used to be a lot more unified uh, in, in their approach in terms of alliance building. And conservative and moderate Democrats agreed with Howard Baker and other moderate to some conservative Republicans on the issue of Goldwater versus Carter and other significant cases of that era um, in what the right result would be. And you don't see it anymore like that. What you see now is one side rips apart the court for issuing a decision they don't agree with or an opinion they don't agree with, and the other side sings the court's praises. And meanwhile, the, the Congress itself becomes somewhat dysfunctional and, and fighting with each other. And we, we haven't had a supermajority in Congress, so I don't know how that would work. Um, but the distrust between the branches of government now today, I would say, is higher than it was at the time of, of Goldwater. And some of it is political opportunism, and some of it is because of what we know. And some of it is actually because our beliefs today, I would say, in key areas like with the overturning of Roe versus Wade, our, our beliefs, wherever one may fall on that or the Second Amendment, are far more embedded, far more um, entrenched, and far more reactionary at times than they were in 1979. Thank you for that. Uh, in, in your book, you mentioned that you uh, you mentioned a number of collections, and I think I counted, it's almost two dozen collections uh, and and a lot more than just our uh, judicial collections. You use yeah. journalists such as Anthony Lewis, Mary McGrory, George Lardner, Edward Brooke, uh, Senator from Massachusetts, Patsy Mink from Hawaii, uh, Herbert Philbrick, William Rusher. Uh, in this range of different collections, uh, was there were there any items that surprised you? I'm always, as an archivist, curious yeah. to see if there was something that uh, you know surprised you and piqued your, your curiosity further. Absolutely. With the journalists, their notes give you uh, the state of mind of the people they're interviewing that don't appear in their articles often, as well as people they interviewed that don't appear in their, their published articles. 
And those handwritten notes are a gold mine. And that I didn't realize that before I started looking in on those. Um, in regard to the members of the Congress, um, I this goes back to when I wrote the book on, on the attempted impeachment of William O. Douglas. I don't think you can write about political and social issues in politics without going to Patsy Mink's papers. I think Patsy Mink is someone who deserves not one biography about her, uh, but does a dozen. I think she was an amazing human being um, who needs to see the light of day. Brooke was the last, I would say, of, 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 um, of moderate Republicans who really was a Republican. He was not a rhino as a derisive term today, but he is, his papers are often great go-betweens as to why he'll explain to, to Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, or even Ronald Reagan, why he's not and others can't support him on certain things and would support him on other uh, presidents on other things. So for me, Brooke is the perfect um, example of a very thoughtful, very bright I would uh, politician who stays true to his constituents, his beliefs, um, as I would say to, to Mink um, about Mink's papers, but but Brooke helps you get into the mind of Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford and and the far right too, because he's often an ambassador between um, the various factions. Uh, then getting into Russia and Philbrick, well, those are conservative, far right wing political activists. And, you know, there are Congress members of Congress that sign up to Goldwater's brief who don't have good collections to them, like John Ashbrook. And I think Jim Jordan sits on John Ashbrook's seats and sort of has continued the, a Ashbrook was sort of the, the beginning of, or at least the, the pinnacle of that, that sort of strain of politics. He doesn't have a great collection. I've been through them in, in Ohio, um, but his best papers are in uh, Rusher's papers. And, and I don't think you can talk about the rise of the far right as it exists today without going to Philbrick and more importantly, Russia. And the big surprise to me is not these aren't just pamphlets. Um, and the surprise to me is the amount of correspondence and the reasoning that's presented by those correspondents like Ash, Ashbrook and others um, in, in those correspondence gives you everything you'd ever wanna know about that. And, and it's, it's, it's at the home of where it should be, where you work at the Library of Congress, because it shapes politics, it's, it shapes our society, it shapes our, our culture, and it's there. No, obviously, I second that answer. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from the audience from Jonah Chadwick Griego. Uh, okay. I hope I pronounced that correctly, Mr. Griego. If I did not, uh, I apologize. After SCOTUS's West Virginia versus EPA decision, could major question doctrine now encompass this subject matter with a conservative supermajority? You know, I, I, I don't, uh, I, the major questions doctrine, I don't think can be a substitute for the political question doctrine. I don't think it can overcome it because the major question doctrine really relates to administrative law where the supermajority has said, there's no way that Congress would have delegated to unelected agency chiefs and agencies the ability to issue decisions that affect uh, issues of major importance or of major economic you know, significance and import in, in the country. The political question doctrine, like in Baker versus Carr, uh, which the court did make a ruling on, Powell versus McCormick, where the court made a ruling on, um, and then Goldwater versus Carter, where it didn't make a ruling on, um, I, I think that sits in its own milieu and has now been protected against um, a, a new, say, a liberal majority came in uh, and tried to use the political question doctrine to overcome the major question doctrine. I just don't see it happening. Those are two independent doctrines that are basically two fortresses that can't encroach into each other now. You know, we got time for one more. And uh, Connie and I were just curious, uh, just to take this up to the current day without getting uh, too political or anything. If Goldwater versus Carter happened today, do you think federal appellate courts would still view presidential authority in foreign affairs as a political question and not for judicial review? Um, it's a subject that has come up uh, in the last six or seven years, at least yeah, for discussion. Well, um, 
I, I think there would be a lot of consideration, but I think the same decision would be over, would be, um, would, would result. But I do think that you would see a much larger uh, and, and, and independent uh, reasonings published in, in the Supreme Court reporter than you saw then. Um, you know, it, it goes back to the, this current court, although they have a super majority I would, of conservatives, I would say they still probably on this issue would insulate themselves from the political question if a president were to come in and say, you know what, I'm done with this Ukraine war support. I'm removing us from NATO. You're up, you're on your own. I don't think the courts would take the issue up uh, today on that. I think there'd be a minority that wanted them to and would issue a real robust um, dissent on that. But I think we'd be back in the, the same place. And then Ro Chief Justice Roberts might say, you know, in the words of my predecessor, Warren Berger, which he would jump back to over Rehnquist in Fitzgerald versus Nixon versus Fitzgerald, you always have the impeachment option. And that's what Berger said. Um, but that does turn impeachment into a political matter, too. So uh, but it, it puts it into a political matter back in the, the Congress as well. Well, thank you for your time, Professor Kastenberg, for a concise and but very dense and informative uh, talk. Uh, one that, again, very timely for a number of reasons. Uh, thank you to Connie Carlage and thank you to Elizabeth Schreiber Byers for producing, as always. And thank you to the audience for attending uh, the talk. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you and please tune in to the next Made by the Library.